Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 205 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Manu Sadia. He's a longtime Star Trek fan who studied history of science and economic history in Paris and Chicago. And we'll be speaking with him today about his new book, Treconomics, about the economics of the Star Trek universe. The book has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Financial Times, and the Wall Street Journal. And now here's our interview with Manu Sadia. All right, so we're here with Manu Sadia. Welcome to the show. Hi, Dave. Okay, so first of all, just tell us about how you got interested in Star Trek. Oh, it goes way back um, as a little kid. I, I grew up in France, uh, and um, we didn't have Star Trek on TV. And I didn't have TV anyways. But So when I was like five, my, I really wanted to go see Star Wars, because that's when it came out. And my parents were like, no, no, no. But then, you know, three years later, they let me go see Star Trek, the motion picture. And so that's how I started my uh, life with Star Trek. Uh, when I was eight, um, and and you know, and and my parents were very happy because it, there was no war like in Star Wars, so they thought it was educational on some level, hmm. and that got me, you know, reading a lot of science fiction as a result because that's really the only thing I could do to uh, prolong the experience and to you know continue to live in the future a little bit as a kid. So uh, that got me started on reading Asimov and Heinlein and all the sort of classics of science fiction. I was, I was a very nerdy kid, I realized. <laughs> so, and of course, it didn't get better because, you know, I, I was a nerdy kid and now I'm a nerdy father. So, <laughs> Well, I thought it was interesting because you, you kind of make it sound like your parents thought that science fiction was going to rot your brain. And they <laughs> let you go see the Star Trek motion picture because you had kind of a family friend who talked them into it? Yes, and she was a total fan of science fiction and it still beats me why and how. Um, I mean, it's not, it, it's not just because of the way the French educational system is set up where, you know, you're supposed to read all your classics and learn them by heart and all that, but that was, a, I mean... If you remember, and if, if you try to transport yourself back to the late 70s, early 80s, science fiction was kind of a marginal genre. Uh, it, it certainly was on TV a little bit, and there were big movies, but it, it was not considered uh, or highly considered the way it is today, where um, pretty much popular culture is science fiction and vice versa. Um, it, it was, it was a very, it, it was something that was not encouraged or even known, I would say. Uh, and especially, you know, in France and in, in translation and all that, I, even though everything was translated, but it was a very, very niche. And so it was a little bit odd. Uh, I would, you know, bring my science fiction books to school and I was reading that and it was just not my, not only my parents, but teachers were like, what are you doing? Um, so, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I would say I learned a, a lot more reading science fiction than anything else. Well, right. And say a little bit more about why Star Trek appealed to you so much. You say in the book that when you saw Star Trek, the motion picture, you say, this is the place I've been looking for. This is where I belonged. Yeah. I, I was trying to, uh, uh, remind myself while writing this of, of how it felt like, and it's true that. I felt somewhat alienated as a kid, but I guess it's it's a very uh, common experience. Uh, and the particulars of my situation were such that maybe I felt a little more alienated than other kids. Um, my father came from Israel to France. I'm 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 sort of a uh, a mutt, uh, and 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 it's not that. I did not fit in the culture. I mean, I, I was French. I'm French. I'm French and American, I guess. Um, but I was not entirely part of it uh, just because of uh, my father's origins. Um, and so in a way, this sort of future and, and speculative world where these type of things did not matter, where you come from, how you look like, you know, the, the color of your skin or... Um, your name or your uh, 
ancestors culture uh, seem to be in Star Trek at least seem to be um, something that did not matter the way it mattered uh, in France in the late 70s and early 80s. Okay, well, so say a little bit about why did you get or how did you get the idea to write a book about the economics of Star Trek? Um, so this is a funny thing. I, I studied a lot of economic history and it was something, you know, we were discussing with friends while watching Star Trek, you know, in grad school. And so it, it, it had been bouncing around my head for a long time. And then um, I, I, I met this guy who used to work on Star Trek um, and we sort of had several beers and, you know, he's, he's, he used to write for Star Trek Enterprise. His name is Chris Black. And, uh, you know, he's a fan of the show as well uh, and a scholar of the show. And, and we're shooting the breeze. And it's like, you know, I was like, so what's missing? I'm looking for a book on the economics of Star Trek. Does it exist? And we looked through his books and all that. And he was like, oh, no, and he's like, you should do it. And so I did. Um, and originally, and I, w I would say that the main impetus of the book was like, this was the book I really wanted to read uh, and I couldn't find anywhere. So I, I sort of proceeded to do it. Um, and there it is. <laughs> and you talk about how there seem to be a lot of economists who are kind of interested in science fiction. You mentioned Paul Krugman and Brad DeLong. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of hilarious uh, uh, um, that uh, the, the, the sort of interest I, I, the book got or received from, you know, academic professional economists is, is surprising. Um, I would mention Joshua Gons as well uh, at the University of Toronto. I mean, it's and and random uh, other colleagues of my wife's who are economists. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a total Star Trek fan. I'm like, what? What's going on here? Um, <laughs> and so it's it's something that kind of baffled me, and I try to figure out why. And I have no good explanation except maybe that science fiction and economy are, uh, economics are are come from the same place, so the Industrial Revolution, and, and maybe they're also interested in very similar, thi similar things, uh, the future. And obviously, economics deals with the future with models and um, data and, and, and mathematical formulas, whereas science fiction is, is more loose in that sense. Uh, but they're interested in the same thing, essentially. Uh, the the act of extrapolating um, empirical observation about the present and trying to figure out where it's going. And so I think it makes sense that economists um, in their practice and in their um, everyday uh, search for uh, uh, identifiers and, and signs of change uh, would be interested in how science fiction does it. It's, it's a way to think out of the box almost. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, the book is primarily concerned with this idea that in the Star Trek future, there's no money. Um, yes. <laughs> and you talk a lot in the book about how this idea developed. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, so in the show itself, um, if you remember, and if you're like the uber nerd of Star Trek, there is some kind of money uh, in the original series. They're, they're called Federation Credits. Um, and if you remember the, the famous Tribbles episode, um, it's all about a trading post somewhere in space where um, Captain Kirk and the Enterprise have to uh, figure out a trade dispute. Yeah. Trade disputes. It's, it's, it's a trope of science fiction. Um, so there is money in the original series. Uh, it's not at the forefront and it's not really the focus of the show and it's not really something that matters the way it matters later in the next generation, but there's money. And then there is this famous scene and very funny scene and the funniest of all the Star Trek movies, but also the greatest, I think, uh, uh, The Voyage Home, you know, the, the Whales movie. Uh, where Captain Kirk uh, goes to dinner with... Um, 
the scientist who's in charge of the whales and <laughs> and she's like oh and and you want me to pay and I, i'm paraphrasing and he's like yeah because we don't have money in the 23rd century so <laughs> and of course they don't um and from then on star trek becomes very utopian in that respect um and then you know in the next generation then it's 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 made clear and emphasized several times in the in the course of the show that the federation does not have money and and in the 24th century we moved past um so it's it's captain picard saying we've we've um overcome hunger and greed and we're no longer interested in the accumulation of things um so yes that's that's what happens money becomes the absence of money i should say becomes a focal point uh of star trek in starting with the next generation and that's particularly funny or interesting and and weird when you think about it because next generation started out in 87 so you know at the end of the reagan years um the year of the wall street crash um it's the go-go 80s you know like the yuppies 80s uh, um when the obsession uh, about money and and greed is good and all that like that that was the dominant uh, cultural theme of the 80s almost and star trek went the other way and presented this sort of it's not a sort of it's presented very aggressively a utopian world where money and greed and hunger and the competition for the acquisition of goods uh, was no longer the focus of life. And, and that's very strange and, and very um, groundbreaking. And, and I think that's one of the concerns of the book is trying to address uh, that. And it's also groundbreaking in the field, in the realm of science fiction, in the genre, because there are not that many science fiction universes that... Um, take money seriously that way or its absence i should say yeah and i mean i don't think i appreciated until i read your book how many ideas in star trek were drawn from isaac asimov yes i was surprised too um i started doing research and then i i realized oh my god um first of all you have like the, the fact that asimov and roddenberry became friends in, in gene roddenberry the creator of star trek became friends in the course of the development of the first series and then later on isaac asimov is credited as scientific advisor on the motion picture uh, so the first star trek movie but also it's his ideas that that shine through um the notion that human labor will be entirely replaced by automated machines uh, this is Asimov's greatest, I think, greatest invention alongside uh, psychohistory and foundation, but separate discussion. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that, that, that too, you see the, the relationship in there in foundation, you see the relationship between economics and science fiction, by the way. Um, but Asimov, so in 1941, he publishes his first story about robots. He invents the term robotics and his great idea and insight is that the robots are not going to be our enemy or our enemies or our doom as a society, the way, you know, usually robots were portrayed as Frankensteins, you know, and the robots will, will liberate us. And so Asimov is trying to figure out a world where labor, human labor is no longer um, necessary for survival. And that is something that you see throughout Star Trek. First, I mean, much more so in the next generation than in the original series. Um, and in the next generation, you do have these incredible machines that will make anything for you on the spot and on demand, the replicators. And in a way, the replicator is a metaphor for um, universal automation, the way it is described in Asimov's robot stories. Um, and so that is something that I found absolutely striking. And I, I, I did when I started digging through and and rereading Asimov for the book, and I was like, "Oh my God, this is exactly." For instance, you you, sorry, I get a little excited. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he wrote so so he started out with um, short stories in the pulps, and then he wrote several novels that um, 
had a robot character called Daniel. Daniel, I, I never knew how to pronounce it, but this was a Android uh, robot. So that's in 54. It's uh, um, uh, the Naked Sun uh, and the Caves of Steel. And this Android robot comes from um, a society. So Earth is isolated and you have the Spacer's world where uh, robots uh, maintain society and are, in fact, uh, uh, the basis of the economy of the Spacer's world. And the Spacer's world, as described by Asimov in his novels, are exactly what the Federation is like, um, where the uh, inhabitants of the Spacer's world the worlds uh, live a life of leisure and free inquiry and art and science rather than uh, toiling uh, for survival the way Earthers do. So that's the main conflict in those novels. But you can see in there the embryo of um, the questions that Star Trek later raised. And then you do have also the fact that <laughs> Asimov, who was a sort of a I don't want to say blowhard, but a little bit of that, um, claimed that he had invented Mr. Spock because the the um, the character of that android robot in Caves of Steel and the Naked Sun, so in the mid-50s, um, it has a lot of similarities with the Mr. Spock that appeared on screen uh, in the late 60s. So, and I find that... Absolutely remarkable. Uh, the the Mr. Data, so the android in the next generation, the famous android in the next generation, has a positronic brain. And that is a term uh, directly called from Asimov. All of Asimov robots are positronic. Yeah, well, well so, so, so walk us through this optimistic Star Trek future. I mean, how, how does it work and how workable do you think it is? <laughs> um, that's the big question, right? Uh, the the first thing to say is that Star Trek society, as described uh, in the TV show, even more so than in the movies, um, is incredibly wealthy. Uh, and it's incredibly wealthy because on the one hand, automation uh, and, and advances in energy production make it possible to have such an abundance or overabundance of things. Um, it is so wealthy, in fact, that uh, the I would say the price of things has converged to zero because anything is available on demand uh, very easily. So that's one thing. The, the second thing is Star Trek society values um, knowledge above all else because that is really where you can compete and you can um, prove yourself and prove your worth. Uh, the, there are so many things and everything is so readily available that it makes no longer any sense to compete for a big bank account. What, what really makes sense in, in the Star Trek universe and Star Trek society is to compete for reputation because this is really where you can distinguish yourself. Um, what is not abundant in Star Trek's universe is the captain's chair. I mean, this is what we see on the show is the the overachievers, the people who really make it to the top uh, and who who uh, spend their lives trying to be good officers in Starfleet or the best scientists in the galaxy. That's what we see in Star Trek. So you have this economy of reputation, I call it. It's not necessarily meritocratic, uh, it's hard to tell from what we see in the show, even though it seems to be functioning in the same way that uh, the scientific community today functions, which is whatever you put out there will be mercilessly uh, reviewed and tested by all your peers uh, and publicly. So it's, it seems that there's this sort of mechanism by which the best people rise to the top and compete for top positions. And then the corollary of that is that because Star Trek's Federation is so wealthy and satiated, it doesn't really need to conquer other worlds. And it does not really need to be an imperial force in the galaxy. Um, 
so what they do when they explore space is no longer to um, start new colonies or conquer territory, but it's rather to further knowledge because that's all that's left to actually compete for, uh, knowledge. So it, it paints a, a sort of very idealistic idea of what could be accomplished. Um, is it realistic? I don't know. Uh, one of the key things to remember about the economics of Star Trek is that at the end of the day, it is a policy decision. It is the result of a policy decision rather than naturally stemming from the um, progress of technology. And I will explain that very simply. Uh, they have the, the Federation uses the replicator and the replicator in the Federation is freely accessible to everybody. It is a public good. Whereas other um, races and a a alien civilizations in the galaxy uh, have replicators as well, but they make it, you know, a paying thing. So um, say the Ferengis, so the, the capitalists of the galaxy, they will make you pay to use their replicators. Whereas in the Federation, you don't have to pay. So it's clearly something that has been decided at some point collectively by um, the Federation and, and all the, the people that make the Federation that, you know, replicators and abundance will be something that is um, freely available to all. Um, so that may be, to me, the main lesson. Uh, if there is any to draw from it is that redistributive policy uh, to put it in economic terms, uh, is, is, is something that you have to decide collectively. It's not something that will naturally occur because of the progress of technology. Right. Well, because you talk a lot in the book about how the characters on Star Trek, especially in the next generation, are kind of all shades of Spock, that they all embody this stoic, altruistic sort of outlook that is so different from most TV drama or just most narrative drama in general. It is very strange indeed. I mean, the, this is where Star Trek, I think, is remarkable as well as the, in the construction of the characters because they are consistent with the economic situation or, or circumstances in which they live, which is, you know, imagine yourself uh, growing up in a society where there is never any want or need or, in, or financial insecurity of any sort. You will be a very different person. Um, you will be some. You will be absolutely uninterested in uh, conspicuous consumption. So the act of acquiring luxuries to signal your status, uh, your economic status in society, and you will be probably interested in things of a higher order or a higher nature: uh, the cultivation of the mind, education, uh, love, art, um, and and discovery. And so the, these people are very stoic in that sense because they have no um, worldly interests that we today could relate to. So it's very hard to relate to them. <laughs> and I, I usually say that they're all aliens in a way. Um, well, the, my friend Chris, who wrote on the show, was like, it was really hard for the writers because, you know, it's a workplace drama, but there's no drama because <laughs> these people are just not uh, inclined to bicker or to have conflicts that cannot be resolved without, you know, they usually resolve their conflicts with some science and, and, and deliberation. And this is not the kind of stuff that you usually see on in a, either a science fiction show or a workplace drama. So it's really hard because... How, how do you write characters who are so perfect? Right. And I mean, one way that the show does introduce drama is by contrasting the Federation with other civilizations like the Borg and the Frankies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that that's the main, I mean, the source of drama is outside of the Federation. Mostly it's the aliens. And, and there, you know, you, you have all these gallery of, of strange people who have a, uh, uh, who seem to be interested in uh, the same things as we are today. Uh, so in a way, you know, the Ferengis, I love the Ferengis because they are sort of a parody of the, um, you know, 1990s or 2000s uh, American acquisitive person, businessman. Uh, it's, 
it's very funny and it's it's a mirror that's given to us uh, i see a lot of ourselves in the ferengis and um for people who are not familiar but i guess most people are familiar most people who listen are familiar to the show <laughs> uh, the i mean the, the ferengis are really they're really ignoble i mean they're they're really awful people uh and they're really funny as a result uh but it, they do change over time when when you watch the whole arc of the Ferengis in Deep Space Nine. The Ferengis, just by contact with the Federation, they become more like the Federation. They become, you know, uh, Keynesian social democrats at the end. Like suddenly, you know, you have the right to have a uh, to have unions and strikes, and uh, there's like healthcare for everybody, and uh, you know, it it it's amazing. I mean, that that is the main lesson there uh, that. You know, but just by contact and almost osmosis, uh, you, you you can become a better society and a more rational society. Um, so that too is a hopeful. Uh, and in a way, you know, I I always thought that Star Trek that this this story of the Ferengis becoming better uh, or or you know more humanitarian in a way just by contact with the Federation is is a metaphor as well of us. Uh, becoming better by watching Star Trek, or it's the wishful <laughs> thinking. You know, it's the wishful thinking of Star Trek that somehow, uh, if you watch enough, you know, you you'll you'll if you watch enough of it, you'll become uh, more attuned and and uh, more uh, in a better disposition towards uh, um, you know <laughs> free healthcare or whatever. <laughs> Well, I thought it was interesting because you have the Ferengis on one hand, but then you have the Borg on the other hand, who kind of represents the dark the dark side of this communitarian redistributive yes. system. That's that's the thing about the Borg. In, in the end, the Borg, they are such a great villain because they're so similar to the Federation. When you think about it, the Borg, they have perfect uh, um, allocation of supply, I mean, of goods and supply and demand, and everybody is connected to everybody in the beehive. And um, they just, you know, seem to be extremely efficient. Uh, and they also are the other society in Star Trek that is, that could be characterized as post-scarcity. Uh, any Borg drone never wants or needs anything. It's always provided by, um, the collective. So it's, it is the, the mirror image and the dangerous image almost of what a society, um, that is both redistributive and, um, satiated could look like uh and and it's almost as if the writers try to incorporate the criticism of the society they propose uh and i that's <laughs> that's what it is uh in the end i think although that's you know again so that i don't get flamed by fans um the introduction of the Borg Queen kind of changed all of it in, in first contact, the movie, and then in Voyager, like it, it, it turned it into something else though. Um, so, uh, let's, you know, the, I'm talking about the original Borg. Yeah. Uh, the... <laughs> well, well, so talk about, I mean, talk a little bit about the future history that Star Trek lays out of how we get from where we are now to the Star Trek future and what you think about the, that story that they tell. So there is in Deep Space Nine, there's a two part episode where Captain Cisco and his crew go back to San Francisco in the middle of the 21st century. And the society that is described then is one where poor people are basically outside of the core of the city. You know, it's walled off and, um, they, they can only go in to work during the day. And then at night they go back outside and, you know, live in squalor. Whereas the, um, an elite, uh, group of people live the good life. Uh, and it's eerily similar to, you know, the kind of situation we're in today. Uh, so, and, and they, the story they tell in this two parter, in this two part episode, it's two episodes, is how, um, in the end, through some violence and uh, a conflict, uh, things start to get resolved. Uh, so that's one part of the story. The other part of the story is the discovery of warp speed and warp drive, uh, and that's retold in, and that's told in the First Contact movie, which is an awesome movie. <laughs> it's also a time travel movie. 
Um, and in there, uh, it's as, so the first contact I was, was kind of weird because you have this sort of rugged mountaineers who are building, um, um, uh, spaceships, you know, out of the mountains somewhere in Montana. I mean, it, it, it's, it's after World War Three. So that's sort of, and, and it's supposed to take place, by the way, uh, at the end of, uh, the, the 21st century. So. I that I have a harder time seeing uh, that happening, um, because the the consequence of inventing the warp drive is that uh, there will be a Vulcan ship passing by on a survey mission that will uh, detect the first uh, jump, and then will make first contact. So that's the story of the movie. Um, the kind of resources that need to be mustered to uh, break the laws of nature, uh, we don't have them yet, and we won't have them for a very long time. So I don't see uh, how we will meet aliens in that way. So that's that's the part that's very wishful. Um, in a way, I would say that if you really want to develop the kind of technology that would allow us to go on interstellar missions and to um, settle other planets, money needs to be no object. It, like We need to achieve such a level of wealth as a society that we could actually decide to spend these resources on building uh, generation ships or you know faster than light travel. Um, we, we need to... In a way, we need to reach Star Trek level of wealth and uh, enlightenment as a society before we engage in uh, this kind of special exploration. Right. And so do you think there are any measures we could be taking right now to set ourselves on the path to this Star Trek future? So interestingly enough, uh, we do have some um, setups and systems that already function like Star Trek in the real world today. I mean, think of the GPS, for instance. Uh, it is maintained by the Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Defense. It costs, you know, a billion dollars a year, so it's very little compared to the entirety of the United States budget, let alone uh, the United States uh, GDP. But the GPS is available for use to anybody without any kind of um, payment. Uh, there are more than 3 billion GPS devices activated in the world right now. Uh, and it's incredibly useful. And it's totally free. And it's provided as a public good. So this is one of these things that um, seem to mirror the type of ethos that you find in Star Trek. Um, the internet is another one. Um, and the, I mean, the famous example on the internet is Wikipedia, where... All the knowledge of the world is at your fingertips and it's free and it has tremendous consequences and advantages in the real world. Um, you no longer have to buy all these big encyclopedias. It's, it's, it's a major thing. It's a profound change. Uh, access to knowledge has multiplying effects on uh, productivity and on um, general economic well-being. This kind of uh, uh, public good access to knowledge is something that is very similar to Star Trek. So I would say that if we decide as a society to make more of these crucial things accessible to all as public goods, we're probably going to be well on our way to um, improve the condition of everybody on Earth. And that, so, so that's the optimistic part. The less optimistic part is that we're facing a clear and present danger uh, with global warming. And that requires the kind of diplomacy and deliberation and um, organization that unfortunately we don't seem uh very well able to uh muster so these are these two things the the third thing i would say is addressed by star trek it's the core of star trek and asimov in a way it's the ro robots and automation and the fact that technology is 
going so fast that we are going to be able to automate most stack, uh, most most tasks, um, and you know, in a short period of time. I was reading yesterday about um, this expert system that <laughs> that has been hired by a, a law firm. So, you know, even these professions, these higher level professions, the uh, automation is not just replacing workers in factories. It's also replacing uh, white collar wor workers by machines and algorithms. Um, and that also uh, raises the question of suddenly, you know, we are going to get much wealthier as a society as a result of automation. But the fruits of um these improvements might not be uh, shared equally among people. Um, that is, uh, the, these are questions that Star Trek um, really elides. I mean, and we, you see the end of that process in Star Trek. It's, you're on the other side of the mountain. Uh, the problems have been, have been solved. Uh, it, it does not give us much in the way of, you know, a 10-step program to how to get there. Uh, that, I think, is our task to actually figure out. Right. So it seems like, you know, this, the, the status quo is disappearing quickly and we're either going to end up like the Ferengis or the Federation. And yes. the degree to which we can become altruistic and generous as a society is going to determine which path we take. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly true. Um, and also it will take a lot of political organization. Um, the, this this is not something that will happen all on its own. I mean, you do have a lot of uh, people in in the uh, you know Silicon Valley and the tech industry who are talking a big game about um, singularity and and all that. I I don't understand what they're talking about. So the, at the end of the day, technology all on its own cannot make the world better. Uh, it it's it has to be something that people and and political organizations and through institution and democracy and good governance that is the only way to achieve the kind of society that star trek uh presents right because you make the point in the book that we're basically at a post scarcity situation with food right now there's i mean more food than we need we could ever need but still one out of six I people mean, uh, does yeah, I mean, look in the United States. We have achieved Star Trek in the United States in terms of standard of living in aggregate. And yet, you know, um, I believe, I mean, there, there's something like some crazy number, like 20% of, of American children are, go hungry um, on a regular basis. And uh, we live in a society that is so wealthy and abundant. So it's clearly not a problem of making more stuff uh, at a cheaper price. It's, it's, a, it's definitely a, a matter of politics and policy. Uh, it is not something, I mean, it, it's revolting when you think about it. Uh, and it, it is not something that uh, uh, will be solved by more gizmos or more, you know, iPhones or this or that invention. This is something that has to be dealt uh, on a political level. Um, and we have to face that. Right. I'm just curious, what do you think about the current state of Star Trek? Because... Um, ah. oh, yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> oh, the current... Oh, oh. Um, they just released the new... Um, well, first of all, I don't want to say anything bad about the J.J. Abrams movies. Um, they're fine. And movies are different from TV series. In a movie, you, you, you have to cater to a different audience. In a TV series, you have much more time to actually describe a world and build it. So it's a different thing. I'm very excited about the new series, personally. So it will come out in January 2017 on the online platform built by CBS. So it's going to be an online-only thing, and you will have to subscribe. Um, and I'm very excited. Uh, the people who are running that new show are just... Uh, 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 Brian Fuller, who used to work on Star Trek, um, and then went on to do several other shows, including Annabelle. And then they recruited Nicholas Mayer, 
who, uh, among other things, is the guy who wrote and directed uh, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and the the Voyage Home, so the Wells movie, and The Undiscovered Country. So he really is the guy who made uh, uh, Star Trek into a viable movie franchise. Uh, and he has a deep understanding and love for the show and for uh, the universe itself. And you could not hope for better people to actually be in charge of this. Um, and it seems like the rumors and the the clues that have been, you know, uh, Easter eggs almost like that's what Brian Fuller said on Twitter. But it seems that the C the new series will be set in between um, the original series and the next generation. Um, so that's uh, that's exciting. Uh, that's very exciting. I I I can barely contain myself. <laughs> 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 I mean, is there anything in terms of economics that you're hoping to see in the new series? Um, yes, but somehow, I mean, Nicholas Mayer, when he was directing the movies and he, he had all these um, debates and, and arguments with Gene Roddenberry, who could not, you know, Gene Roddenberry at the time was like, was not allowed to touch the movies because he had messed up with the motion picture. Um and Nicholas Mayer, in his memoirs, uh, recalls how he thought Roddenberry was full of, um, full of it, uh, full of it, in terms of how humans would behave in the future. Uh, so, so there was a clash right there—a clash of vision and a clash of um, positions as to what humanity could be or could become. Uh, so. I expect that there will be some of that tension in the new series and that the characters will be more relatable to us today. Uh, it might not be the full-on crazy utopian vibe of the next generation. Uh, it might be something that it has more conflict and, and explosions and fights. Um, so, you know, it's... It's good in itself as well. Like I said, it's, uh, entertainment is, is part of the game, and uh, I want to be entertained. Um, so I'm very excited for that. But I don't think, you know, they will really uh, lay it on thick uh, on the utopian economics the way Gene Roddenberry did for Next Generation. See, I'm really intrigued by the utopian aspects because I feel like if you took someone from 1600s Europe or something, our society, like people today, would be unimaginably nice uh, yes, compared, compared to anything they could have ever imagined. <laughs> yes, they'd be tall, they'd be in very good health, uh, they'd be very well fed, and um, they'd have much better manners. Uh, they, they, it would be un incomprehensible. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good thought experiment. Uh, give uh, a book about today, you know, give a book written today to somebody in the 16th century and they'd be like, what is this? These are aliens. These are, uh, this is, this is not possible. This is never going to happen. Uh, how is that even imaginable? And there's some of that in Star Trek as well, I would say. Right. I mean, it's, it's, that's the, that's the part that makes sense to me. And by the way, we say utopian, but I don't think in terms of purely on the basis of economics, I don't think it's crazy. Um, if we continue on our path, on our current path to, um, you know, growth and productivity gains and, and economic growth, just by the magic of compounding in 300 years, we'll, we'll be like 12 times more wealthy or something like that. I mean, I have the numbers in the book and it depends which multiplier you use. So it's complicated. But the, the, the fact remains that just by the, the magic of compounding and compounding uh, gains, um, 200 years from now, if, if we solve the global warming problem or if we manage it, uh, the world will be incomparably wealthier and, and in a much better position. And the standards of living will be incomparably higher and almost to the point where it's incomprehensible for people today. Right. And you make the point, too, in the book that Treconomics might be part of the solution to global warming because... The reason it's so hard to get political action on global warming is because you have the fossil fuel industry spending billions and billions of dollars to misinform people about the science. And if that economic incentive to be deceptive in that way disappears, it would be a lot easier to organize collective action. Yes, uh, but it would take collective action to actually 
uh, remove the incentive uh, to be deceptive. <laughs> um, what, what you're asking the fossil fuel industry is to basically commit suicide. Um, so no economic actor uh, will do that gladly without compensation or without, you know, will 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 do that gladly without a fight. Um, and the problem of collective action is the main problem. Um, how do you get actors with very um, contradictory interests and goals to uh, work in common is uh, especially, you know, states. Uh, you do have a lot of countries that rely on oil for their power and for their wealth and for their existence. So how, how do you... Um, How do you change that? How do you make it uh, uh, a good deal for them? There's that. And then, you know, you also have the fact that it's the United States and Europe that consumed most of the fossil fuels in the past 200 years uh, to achieve wealth and uh, high standards of living. And now we're asking countries like India and China and Indonesia to not do this. Uh, do we have a right even as we in the North are the main polluters? Do we have the right to ask these people not to raise their standard of livings the way we did? Um, it's really unfair. Uh, and it calls for uh, the sort of compensation mechanisms that are incredibly hard to put in place um, on a global level, as we've seen. I mean, we do have an agreement, the Paris Agreement, that was signed you know, last year, but this is incredibly difficult. Uh, and it's even more difficult when you think about uh, the fact that those who are going to suffer the most from global warming are not the wealthy countries. The wealthy countries will get by because they're wealthy and they have institutions that are stable and, and there are ways to manage this. I mean, it's not going to be fun, but you know, Miami will go under water. Miami will disappear. But... Um, Miami is not that big uh, compared to the entirety of the U.S. economy. Bangladesh is in a whole lot more trouble than we will ever be. Um, Bangladesh, you know, is a delta, and if the sea rises by a meter, so three feet, uh, the, 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 the consequences of this will be absolutely horrendous. Um, And Bangladesh does not have the same resources as the United States. So that, that's, that's where I'm really concerned. And this is where, you know, trichonomics or, or the idea that we should um, enact more redistributive policies, not only within our countries, but between countries, uh, is probably something necessary. I don't know if it's possible. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we just need to get the fossil fuel executives to watch Wrath of Khan enough times so that they <laughs> are inspired. Or to maybe sacrifice. not. You know, I mean, there's also this thing about uh, game theory that's, uh, I mean, it's the prisoner dilemma. Um, it's probably better for them and for some countries to um, make as much money now as possible until the end game, because then you're well positioned for the reckoning. Um, so. That that is something that uh, I find very foreboding, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it's it's this is where Star Trek would help, but I don't know if um, altruism uh, would stand in the face of uh, economic rationality. All right, well, I don't want to end things on such a bummer <laughs> note. So, like, <laughs> give us give us some more hope for the Star Trek future. Well, uh, the the spread of knowledge. And actually, this may be where we might make it, is that the spread of knowledge, thanks to the internet, um, is able to move mountains. Uh, the free flow of information, the, the last time we had this, such an explosion in the free flow of information um, and in the sharing of knowledge, so with the invention of the printing press, it led to incredible improvements in society and transformation in the way people related to each other, um, the Reformation, and then, you know, later on, the political revolutions in Europe are direct uh, consequences of the invention of a printing press. So we're just at the dawn of that with the internet. And I think that 
the ability for people to find any information they need to design solutions for themselves uh, and to educate themselves in science and philosophy and in economics and uh, you know, all sorts of things like that makes it very hopeful. The human brain is the ultimate resource um, and will never run out of it. And when you network human brains together, who knows what you can do? I like to think that science fiction podcasts are going to save the world. <laughs> nice. Yes. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I have no comeback to that, but I, <laughs> I tend to agree actually that, um, and, and, you know, I'm, you're encouraging me here to, to put on my advocate hat, but I mean, part of the reason, the small reason I wrote the book was also for that, uh, and, and to spread that notion that maybe, or, you know, to, to publicly spread that notion that maybe we can do it if, if we, um, you know, learn more and become more caring for each other and, and become more interested in science and in technology and, and being able to appropriate it for ourselves and to find our own solutions. Um, I, I, I believe in that. And, and this is the message, uh, if any, of Star Trek. All right. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. So we've been speaking with Manu Sadia. And again, this book is called Treconomics. So Manu, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, David. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Manu Sadia for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Natalie Grant Logan and Marie-Yves Gautier, who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.